Hey, hey everybody, uh, this is Dr. Sean from Vitality Chiropractic. Welcome back to our interview series where I'll be talking with other healthcare practitioners about their stories, how they got started, and of course, the people that they help. Today, my guest is Pooja. Pooja is a qualified functional medicine uh, practitioner and is the clinic director of the nutrition clinic based here in Singapore. Pooja, how's it going? Good, good. How are you? Not too bad so far. It's a nice sunny day today. It doesn't seem like it's going to rain, which is a, yes. <laughs> a nice change. <laughs> So for those people who've never been to see somebody about functional medicine, how would you explain functional medicine to them? So um, functional medicine as a practice is in a lot of ways taking what we know in natural therapy, which is that the body is a collection of systems. So it's looking at the body as systems, but you look at that through the lens of biochemistry, through the lens of science. So it's really looking at how does our lifestyle, how does our food, affect the pathways in the body. And there are so many pathways in the body. My training is in the nutrition part of functional medicine. There are medical doctors who practice functional medicine and my focus is on nutrition and lifestyle. Um, but the whole space basically starts off by saying, if you have a symptom, there could be so many underlying root causes. And the process we use is to try and get to those root causes and then systematically fix them. Um, so that, that's really what functional medicine is. It's, it's quite hard to explain, but the best, way is to, it's, the best way to explain it, I find, is to say it starts with the assumption that the body is a collection of biochemical systems and pathways, rather than just you have a pain, there has to be just the one cause. Now, you have a pain, it could be a number of causes, and we look at how all of those work together, and then how do we fix all of that um, step by step. Okay, so if we're going to go back from the beginning then, what got you started into this particular profession? So I trained as a biochemist. My, this is my second career. I trained as a biochemist and worked, I used to work with a venture capital fund and I was um, looking at biotech investments. So I spent a lot of time looking at how to, uh, how to bring companies that were coming up with new research into fruition. And that was, you know, that, that was, that was exciting. It was very exciting. I was much younger. It was my first, my first job. I was traveling a lot. Uh, looking back now, I know it wasn't a great fit for me emotionally. You know, it was something I could do. I think I did it reasonably well, but I didn't feel the click that I feel now, that sense of it being a fit. And uh, the turning point for me was uh, while I was in the midst of all of that, my father felt very, very critically ill and we took him to the US, we took him to Johns Hopkins University uh, for, um, for, for some treatment. And that's when I started just taking that stock and saying, okay, uh, here's a family member who's not well. We are looking into the what's, what to do, the whys, why did all of this happen? And that was really the spark of the idea for me. I wanted to know more about prevention. I know that medicine is there and I have complete respect for uh, using medicine when you need it. I do think that the best of both worlds is always the best option. Uh, I don't believe one practice is better than the other. I think integration is the answer. And so it struck me at, at Hopkins that there was a conversation starting to happen about diet and heart disease, about Tai Chi and cancer. You know, the integration was starting to happen. And I hadn't yet seen that in this part of the world. So that was really the spark of the idea for me. Um, came back home. My father remained quite unwell for, for the next decade. And so I saw medicine very close up and I was very grateful that it was there to help him. But I personally wanted to understand more about how do I prevent this from happening? Is genetics to play? Is it stress? Is it food? Is it toxins? Uh, you know, all of that, all those questions started coming up for me. Um, and then the second trigger for me was when I wanted to have, have a child and the doctor said to me, look, this is not going to happen naturally. You need to go through IVF. And I didn't like how I felt on that process. Uh, so that was the time when I actually quit what I was doing. I actually sat down and went back to study, uh, which, was, which was interesting. I decided to, I first was considering some training as counseling, but then I think the biochemistry really made it quite interesting for me to look at what was happening in nutrition. And um, I met with somebody called Dr. Jeffrey Bland, who's considered the, the father of functional medicine. He was here on a conference and I got to meet him. And that really made me quite excited about using my background with what I could, I, I could do in this space. And there was um, some really interesting conversation happening around fertility and 
uh, and everything that functional medicine does. Functional medicine looks at stress. It looks like it looks at diet. It looks at detoxification pathways. It looks at deficiencies. And I just decided to put myself on a program. I, I did whatever research I could on my own. I connected with people who were doing this work in the UK and in the US. And I, I biohacked, I, I experimented on myself. And I just said, okay, I'm giving myself some time to see if this works. It worked, I have, a, I have an 11 year old beautiful daughter. And uh, then I knew this had to become my career. I just felt like this, this has worked for me. I felt really, really good and I felt empowered. I think that was what I was really looking for, that sense of empowerment. I feel like that's something that's very common in a lot of people in healthcare, especially when it's not necessarily the mainstream, whether it's a dentistry or medicine, it's that someone goes into something and it impacts them or a loved one's life and it just takes them in a new direction. Absolutely, yes. Absolutely. You mentioned about fertility and of course about say your dad. What kind of patients would you see on a more typical basis now? So I see two types of patients. One, uh, one group would be the people who are medically healthy. There isn't a diagnosis, there isn't anything wrong, but they're not feeling their best. And that typically shows up as I'm not able to sleep. I don't have energy. I just don't feel vibrant and energetic. Um, I have digestive symptoms. My skin's acting up. It's that whole category where it isn't a big medical problem, but it's not, it's a person not feeling their best. Um, and that's really, um, I would say that's at least 50, not 50 to 60% of the people I see. The rest are people who do have a medical condition or who have an, an underlying condition that is being treated medically and they want to add a layer of lifestyle and diet uh, guidelines to that. So these would be people with uh, autoimmune conditions, diabetics, people with high cholesterol, uh, people with anxiety. Um, so I do get quite a lot of referrals in these areas as well. I do see some people who um, are interested in, in fixing fertility, of course, that's, that's an area that uh, I know I, I'm very passionate about. I see mainly people in their 30s to 60s, so it's the people who are working, who want answers. I think what we do really well is get you from point A to point B in a very systematic manner. So people who don't really have the time but who want answers are drawn to what we do, I think, because we, I, I think we do that well. We, we get people to, we get, we get answers and then we have a step-by-step -step process to take you to, to where you need to be. Okay, can you tell me a bit more about that process? What would it be like, say, for the normal person that walks into your practice? Sure. Um, when somebody comes in, we um, obviously we do a thorough um, health assessment, goal assessment, medical assessment. Uh, people can work with us in one of two ways. One is more of the the a la carte, the traditional model where you pay per consultation and you do a number of tests based on what um, I think they need, what their goals are. And then they come in once a month to see me. Um, that's how we started and that's the way we have grown. But in the last couple of years, what's really taken off for us is an alternative model that we call membership. And membership is a, is a far more involved, it's, it's a partnership between us and by us, I mean myself and a coach. I have a coach, uh, a lifestyle coach who works with me. So we together work with each member and uh, a membership is typically an eight month program. And in those eight months, it's a really guided program with uh, a whole layer of how do we change habits? How do we change lifestyle habits, food habits, movement habits, sleep habits? There's a lot of accountability. There is a lot of contact. We don't count consultations and memberships. So people pay per month. They, they, pay, they pay a certain amount every month. And that takes care of all their tests and all their, all their consultations or sessions with us. We do a combination of face-to-face, -face, obviously Zoom now, uh, the face-to-face -face move to Zoom. Um, we do a lot of WhatsApp support between appointments. So it's not about what happens in the consultation because as you can appreciate with anything to do with the lifestyle, what happens between the consultations is really most important, right? I mean, you sit and talk to somebody and say, well, look, how, much, how much sugar do you typically eat? What do they remember? There is that recency factor of, well, I ate really well yesterday. Do I tell her that? Or do I tell her the way I ate over the weekend? And so the accountability that comes with membership is fantastic. Clients send us photos of all their meals if we need that level of in, in, interaction. So we get to see how they're doing and that just makes it a far more precise way of, of getting results. And I really like that method. I think that is the way forward for us as a practice. 
Okay, and you mentioned about some of the tests. One thing that interested me a lot more compared to, say, some of the other functional medicine people I've talked with before is I know that you, say, do things like, say, fecal samples and other tests. Can you yes. tell people more about the tests yes. that you would conduct? So we do food sensitivity testing, which is a really great way of just figuring out if a food or a bunch of foods is just not suiting you. It's not an allergy. It's a delayed sensitivity. And sensitivities can be linked to everything from low energy to hair fall to weight, water retention, um, obviously digestive issues, joint pain. So that's a great starting point. We also do um, some tests to see if there are deficiencies. We get a check-in of uh, our client's adrenal health, so just the stress response, and we do the fecal samples, the, the gut microbiome test as well. Okay, cool. So for those kind of things, how long would the results usually take before they could start making changes? So the, uh, our clients all start making changes immediately. So it takes about a month to get results. It takes three weeks, but there is a process of collecting the samples, sending them. So we, we typically say it's a month. In that month, what we do is without any supplementation, without any test knowledge, we get everybody to clean up the diet because really we are about food first. And while the tests and supplements are fantastic tools, the real work is what you eat, what goes onto your plate. Um, every day. So we really get people to focus on whatever we can do through lifestyle. So it's largely food, but it's sleep, it's movement. We get that fixed in that month so that by the time the results come in, they're already in a better place. And if they're not in a better place, if they've tried something and it doesn't work, that's also data. We're, we're collecting that data from our clients through through their tests, but also through their symptoms and their experiences. So we know if we've introduced somebody to cutting out grains, for example, and they feel fantastic, that that's obviously the right direction for them. But if they're, if they feel terrible because they need that level of carbohydrates because there are hormonal issues, then we also know, and then we can put that information along with their test information. And it becomes a really powerful combination of, of, touch, of data points that we use. Okay. And is there any particular patterns that you see in patients? I know one thing that I've heard before is a lot of people have, say, yeast buildups, especially if they're higher stress, they're working in the city. Are there any patterns that you see a lot with your patients? Oh, gosh, so many. Um, gluten is a big problem for many, many people. Um, and I know a lot of people question the whole gluten, the excitement, and, and is it a fad, is it not? I can tell you that a lot of people feel amazing when they cut out gluten. Not everybody. Uh, but many, I would say most people do. So gluten is, is a big issue. Um, I do see a lot of people benefit just from cutting down grains in general. Um, I see yeast as a, as a big issue. I see a lot of deficiencies. So B vitamins, particularly B6, is a, is a massive deficiency that we see. Magnesium deficiency is another one. Um, so there are certain patterns, and I think they all come back to just the way we live, right? The quality of food, the level of stress, the lack of sleep. Um, so those are the, the patterns that we see all fit in with that city type person who is very busy, who travels too much, doesn't get enough downtime. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> okay. And what are some of your views on fat? Because I know, of course, fat is a very heavily debated issue, not just now, but for the past few decades. What are your personal views on fat? So, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. It kind of goes back to my personal story. When my father first started falling sick, Dean Ornish was, Dr. Dean Ornish was very popular and his, his research was obviously very interesting. And so my whole family went on a massive low fat diet. And then as, you know, as research came out, fish oil came in and, and some fat came in and now avocados have come in. So I've, I've kind of seen the fat story personally as well, just through what I've gone through with, with my own uh, family experience. Look, I think the answer is that going to an extreme is not a good idea. I don't like the low fat diet, but I'm also not convinced that the keto diet is for everybody. So there are lots of people who are going to the other extreme. We have to consider genetics. So if you have a strong family history of heart disease, and you go on a keto diet, I think it's a question mark. I think you need to tread cautiously. I see a lot of people jump into diets like that. I think you do have to look at uh, your genetics. You have to look at population studies. I think some fats are obviously a good idea. We know it's needed for, for brain. We know it's needed for mood. But do you go to an extreme position? I don't think that's a good idea. Unfortunately, we live in a world with you know, with social media, and as wonderful as it can be, I think you almost have to be louder and louder to get noticed. So, you know, 16-hour fasting doesn't, doesn't interest anybody. You need to go for, 
you know, three days or five days and you need to have, you know, super amounts of butter and bacon to get noticed. So I think there is a lot of that kind of um, thinking around nutrition. And I, I don't think that's a good idea. And I think um, even if you consume that much fat, you have, your body has to digest it and not everybody can digest that much fat. Uh, but should you go to the extreme of cutting out fat? Absolutely not. I don't. I think, and I think that's been proven. I think. I think we've seen globally that that's not worked. Uh, the quality of fat matters a lot, of course. So that's. And I mean, I, I tried, I did a year of cyclic keto and I can say, yeah, like mental clarity and everything was great. But yeah, like you mentioned, you're not getting the fiber in your diet. So I don't want to get too much in depth in it, but it's not <laughs> the most fun. Um, yes. And those points where I, I'd stand up and I'd slightly black out and it's like, okay, but I should eat an apple or something. Exactly. I'll, I'll exactly. the time for that. Yes. Um, what are some of the biggest challenges that you see either in your practice or with some of your clients? Um, the biggest challenge with clients are, and, and I, you know, I, I understand where it comes from, but I think I see a lot of people who, um, who turn up, they want, they want to do right. They want to do right by their body. They, they, the goals are there. The intention is there, but the ability to take the first few steps is really challenging for them. Um, and that's one of the reasons we've introduced coaching in our practice because, I really do believe that the combination of coaching and functional medicine, uh, clinical work is a really powerful combination because ultimately, you know, I can re make recommendations, but the doing is a challenge. We are stuck in our patterns. You know, food is so much more than nutrition. It is, it's emotion, it's family, it's culture, it's memory. We, we have to take all of that into account. And what coaching allows us to do is to start untangling some of that and say, okay, you can't take the big steps, but what are the little steps you can take? What are the things you can do? You know, it might just be a green smoothie that you do every day or some bone broth or just cut out that extra sugar. And maybe that's enough as a starting point. So what coaching has uh, helped us do, it, it is, it's not, um, it's helped us address that challenge. Is that challenge still a challenge? Absolutely. I think, it, I think it is. And I think it will always be. There isn't a magic wand to get everybody to, you know, work a certain way and, and I think that's part of what makes this whole process very interesting as well because there is such a human we're so involved in the human experience here of making these changes what about for yourself then what would you say is kind of a, a typical diet for yourself or is it kind of more diverse um, it's fairly typical so I tend to be low grain if not no grain I'm, I'm not you know we, we do believe that when you're fixing a problem you need to be really strict but you can't be in a strict space for the rest of your life. I don't think that's the way to live. So, you know, when I have needed to go completely zero grain, I do that. So I do that for periods of time, but day to day, will I get a little bit of grain in? Absolutely. If I feel like it, I will listen to my body and get it in. I will have a little bit of fruit, but I tend to be very low sugar. Uh, my family history shows me that Sugar is something that I need to be careful with. I come from a family filled with diabetics, not my immediate family. And that's been interesting. My extended family has a lot of diabetes. My immediate family, my mom, for example, doesn't because she's been very careful with her, with her diet. She's very careful with her lifestyle. And so it's shown to me that that control alone makes a big difference. Um, so I am generally very careful with, with sugar. Um, I, I'm not vegetarian. I tend to do better with protein at every meal. Um, I went through a stage of cutting out eggs because I found that I had a food sensitivity and it wasn't hurting. If it wasn't suiting me, it was hurting my gut. I brought them in, but not too often. Um, so I do experiment. Obviously one does with, with oneself, um, uh, but it tends to be lots of veg. It tends to be closer to the paleo diet. So lots of veg, lots of color, protein, organic, clean as, as clean as possible, some healthy fat, um, a little bit of fruit, if, if I feel like it, um, but I, you know, I keep away from the obvious junk food, obviously. Yeah. With regards to fruit then, what would be your views on fruit juices and uh, even juice cleansers? Because I know it's again, another big kind of like fad diet that a lot of people yeah. get into. Yeah. I don't like juice cleansers. I mean, once you know about how liver, how the liver detoxifies, juice cleansing makes absolutely no sense. You need a whole bunch of nutrients, particularly amino acids to get through all the stages of detoxification which you're not going to get on a juice cleanse. And so I think a lot of, I see a lot of people who've done a juice cleanse and they felt worse. Quite often the skin has an issue. And I think what's just happened is that the body isn't able to detoxify. You kind of just shifted 
um, shift, shift to toxins in the body. Um, that There's also the whole issue of sugar in fruit juice, right? So a lot of people find that if they have an underlying yeast issue, that flares up if you do a juice cleanse. And, and many people call it a healing reaction. I don't think it's that. I think it's just not a good fit for the body. I think juice cleanses have way too much sugar. Fruit juice, even fresh fruit juice can have way too much sugar. Uh, I think if you're doing juices, you put some vegetables in, so put celery and cucumber in, make that the base, and you can add a little bit of fruit for the sweetness, but a full glass of fruit juice is not necessarily healthy. Yeah, and what are your views on, say, fermenting, whether it's kefir, kombucha, of course, kimchi, or... I think fermenting is popular. great. I think fermenting is great. I wish I had the patience to do it myself. I don't do much of it. <laughs> but I think it's great. I, I've been thinking during this whole um, circuit breaker time that I should try fermenting some vegetables and try my hand at that. It sounds like a fun thing to do. I've done sauerkraut, but that's as far as I've gotten. But I get my mom to make kefir for us. I've outsourced that to her and she'll, you know, make kefir for the whole family. <laughs> but I think oh. fermenting is great. Absolutely. I'd say after the call, if you, uh, if, 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 if I forget, I have enough scoby from kombucha and plenty of oh, grains, so you're more than welcome. You're oh, more thank than you. Welcome. I think I'll do that. I'll, try, yeah, I'll take you up on that. That's no problem. Uh, one thing I was going to ask then, what do you find have been the value between, say, something like you mentioned, kefir, or something compared to, say, more, um, like, say, powders or, or, or pills that people are taking in terms of their probiotics? Do you think that, that one is better than the other? No, I think there's a place for both. I think so if you've done, say, a um, gut microbiome test and somebody's got very low levels of, of probiotics, uh, we will use supplements at a really high dose for a period of time. And that's the whole idea of being strict and being quite um, even aggressive with supplements. I can, be, I can use supplements for a period of time at a, at a good dose just to get those results. But then on maintenance, when you're maintaining... Uh, a, a person through through all the, after the work's been done, I think that's when fermented foods are a great idea to prevent a problem from coming again. Honestly, one can do both, but I, from my experience, just the fermented foods may not fix the problem enough quickly enough for most people. That's where the powders may be needed for a period of time. And I, you know, I keep people on supplements for maybe two three months at a period, for for a block, see how they do, and then take them down and start using food alternatives as, as in, in this case, it would be a fermented food. I, mean, I agree, I think, especially as a mentality thing, it can be, again, like you said, it's very, very useful in the beginning, the same way if anyone has any kind of ailment, if they need to take some sort of medicine, it's great, but if it becomes this habit, even if it's mentally of taking a pill for everything, it, it kind of takes us away from where we should be and it makes it too easy to get stuck in other kind of med medication as well. Yes, I, there's no pill that's going to replace a healthy diet. So if somebody comes to me and just says, I don't want to change my diet, I just want to buy pills, that's not really what we, that's not really what we do best. We really want to fix the problem, get you the right supplements, use the supplements to really drill down and fix a very focused issue. But the food changes, and it's phenomenal when I think about the changes that many of our members make in particular, because we're working with them so closely. When they look back at their diet, um, they can't believe the journey they have made. So, you know, by at some point, even after cutting out, say, gluten or dairy or eggs, if people are sensitive, I will want them to bring it back in just to test the body out. And many of them don't want to, but they're done with those foods because they're done with feeling that way. So we do find that uh, many of our clients make this tremendous shift in their whole approach to how they eat. And that's really satisfying. That, that, that's incredible. And... I know that, of course, for yourself, generally quite busy in the practice. What would you say are some of the biggest factors of your success? Um, gosh, um, I, think, I think simply loving, loving, loving what I do. And I have the most amazing team of people who I work with. Um, the whole business started with me and a friend of mine, who's my business partner. And we uh, were just spending time. Our kids are around the same age. It was a play date conversation that led to the setup of the nutrition clinic and she is one of my best friends it's just amazing to have that friendship relationship and work all combined together and I know for some people that's a scary combination for us it works really well uh, and then the people who joined us we have uh, Bonnie who is the coach and she also helps with business development and she's she's been incredible I mean she's just come up with so many ideas and I think it's just this whole sense of collaboration 
uh, could we have um, uh, our latest, our newest employee, somebody called Fong, who is who manages the place, and she's done a phenomenal job. And you know, it's been it's been difficult not seeing everybody through this because as much as I miss seeing my family, I also miss seeing the people who I work with because we just do have a lot of fun. And I think we keep a very open mind. We have a lot of conversation. We brainstorm a lot. I don't think we limit ourselves, and that's our strength and perhaps our weakness at the same time, right? So I we have we have lots of ideas. <laughs> I mean, especially at times like now, this is the time where we have to adapt. And Absolutely. Have to enjoy this. So, so we have a lot of ideas, yes. <laughs> so for the practice and for, say, your overall profession, what are some goals that you have at the moment? So we'd really like to see membership take off. Um, we've, the last year and a half has been like a testing bed to see, does it work? We've collected really interesting data from the people who've gone through it. We know it works. We know that it's the way forward. We'd like to just take that to the next level and make it available to more people. Okay. And is there any goals that you'd like to see, say, within your own profession, maybe between you know yourself and other colleagues, or what other colleagues could hopefully aspire for, either here in Singapore or even in other countries? I think I'd like, and there are a lot of people who are um, you know working in this space. I think what you're doing there, just getting a community of people together is a great idea. I'd love to do that more. It's not something that I naturally do. I tend to just get on, you know, the, the practice can be really busy. And so the focus is very much on, on getting that done and getting that growing. But I'd like to see more of a community. And I feel like that's perhaps the next step for us to really build a community of practitioners. Okay. And uh, not just, of course, based on the current pandemic we're experiencing now, but in general, what are some changes that you might like to see in healthcare systems, either here in Singapore or in other countries? I think this whole conversation of integration is really the way forward. And I know compared to when I think of where, you know, where all of this started for me, where um, when I look at what's changed in Singapore, when, when I was looking at what was happening at Hopkins, it was a very different in Singapore, I think there is more integration. I get I get a lot of referrals from medical professionals. I'd like to see more of that. I'd like to see more conversation around, particularly food and chronic illness, because I think there is so much that can be done through food and lifestyle uh, before medication necessarily comes in, or in addition to medication, if that's if that's required. So I'd like to see that, and I think that's something I'd like to see everywhere. And I think it's it's perhaps uh, two different degrees a question that a lot of people are are asking. And for the people that are currently either on, you know, circuit breakers, lockdown, or they're at home, what kind of tips or advice would you give them for this kind of period? So when, I'm, when I speak to clients, the, the messages or the, the trends that I'm seeing is people are struggling with sleep. Uh, okay. Some people are now starting to struggle with anxiety. I think it's just reached that point where it feels like it's a bit too long. It, that perhaps the initial novelty has, has kind of worn out for, <laughs> for everyone. Um, I, I think to begin with, I saw a lot of people turn this into an opportunity. It was actually really interesting to see how many clients use the extra time they have to do different things that they wouldn't typically have time for. Um, but now I think that fatigue is coming in. So I think protect your sleep. Uh, I think it's really tempting to eat more or to eat differently because I think when you go out, you kind of punctuate your whole day with food, right? And right now it's, it's like, it's actually like a long flight where you're waiting for the food trolley to keep coming, giving you snacks. It really does feel like that for a lot of people. But I think just forcing some structure. So for me personally, I found that doing intermittent fasting has been really, it's been a great tool that I've used and I've stretched it to longer while I'm at home because I know that there will be there'll be more coming in the rest of the day. It's not going to be as structured. It's also about food preparation for an entire family every day, right? Which, which is more demanding than it was when, uh, when we were all doing our own thing. So I think to be gentle with yourself, to find ways in which you can structure things. Um, I think for many people getting out and exercising has been great. And I think the fact that we have to now run or walk briskly to skip the mask is a great incentive. I like to use that. Um, so I think just find ways to uh, eat well, get, you know, get food simple. And it doesn't need to be complex, but get really simple recipes. And if somebody's interested to know more, we do have a pantry guide on our website, particularly for this period. So what can you stock up on? We'll be happy for anybody who reaches out to us just to help them with some tips some recipes to get them started. So do reach out if you have questions about food preparation and how to make this time work for you. 
Perhaps, I mean, if you can send me that link, I'll put it into the comments for this, awesome. this video to make sure everyone has access to that. Fantastic. Thanks. Yeah, it's, it's interesting you say about the fasting. I mean, I've, I've been fasting for a while and now, yeah, I've done the same thing. Sometimes it's 8 or 9 p.m. before having a meal if it's not been, you know, a particularly active day. But exactly. I have exactly the same problem on planes. It's like I'm on a buffet. So there's this exactly. almost food insecurity kicks in when you're going to be on a six hour flight. Like, yes. it's very, very strange. <laughs> so uh, before we end today, uh, getting a little bit more personal, if you could talk to yourself, say, five years ago, what kind of advice would you give to yourself? So when I think about five years ago, I think the, um, as a practice, there was maybe, you know, we, we were doing to some extent similar things to what we're doing now. We were maybe doing a lot less testing. We've started doing that more. But there was, there was this concern or there was this question, do we need to do something bigger, bolder, brighter? Do we need to have a retail shop? Do we need to do something that's scalable? Do we need to be more visible? And very honestly, that's not necessarily my, that's not necessarily who I am, but that was often the kind of the expectation of, that I felt I had of myself. And it's taken me the last five years to realize that if I do what I do well and improve on that, I can reach those same goals. I can reach more people uh, doing membership and doing the clinic. And maybe now I think the ability to do it through Zoom has just opened up so many so many opportunities for us. We don't need to rely on, on that physical space. Uh, maybe there are ways of growing while still being true to yourself. And I think that's been, that's something that I would, I would say, uh, to just trust that inner voice. Okay, that's a great, that's a great sentiment. Um, thank you so much for joining me today, thank Pooja. You. Uh, thank you for everybody who's been watching this live or is watching again on the replay. If you have any questions, of course, you can always contact me on 84389550 or at help at vitalitychiropracticcenters.com. Of course, if you have any questions about nutrition or about any issues you may have going on, you can talk to Pooja and she will be tagged with the nutrition clinic into our description as well. I'll make sure that we have the link for the, uh, the pantry items that she mentioned as well put into our comments or hopefully into the description as well. Again, if you have any questions, always let us know. And otherwise, everyone stay safe and, and have a great day. Thank you so much. Have a good day too, Pooja. Bye-bye.